All right. Well, I've just started recording and thanks Jason for um, being our um, lecturer host for the Champaign-Urbana blockchain meetup today. Uh, it is Friday the uh, 20th of March and since we can't meet, meet in person at Enterprise Works due to the coronavirus restrictions, um, we're going to do this virtual meeting and we'll uh, see if anyone else joins us here in the room and we'll also be posting it online for everyone to review at their leisure. So I'll turn it awesome. over to you. Thank you, Adam. So I initially wanted to go over how blockchain can be used to automate supply chains because it's a project that I've been tasked with um, building for the Gies Disruption Lab. And um, before I get to talking about that, um, I wanted to talk more about um, smart contracts and look at some of the applications that are out there and publicly on, a th on the Ethereum blockchain and look at some of the code that they have um, to kind of do a bit of analysis of why um, building a application uh, for automating supply chains um, and even managerial, any managerial role uh, would make sense. So that's where I want to start. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about first is just going over smart contracts and what they are and specifically on Ethereum um, and then talking a bit about the smart contracts that you can the, the source code for these smart contracts that you can find on Etherscan. And then um, we'll have a bit of discussion about um, basically everything that I present and on um, automating on automating tasks on a uh, blockchain or achieving automation on blockchain. Um, so I actually had a bit of some like preamble before we get started. I just wanted to like have a clarification um, I had some people asking me for like some like consultation in the last meeting and I just wanted to clarify that I'm a power user. Um, I've always have been a power user, which makes me uh, much more um, prone to working hands on with products and tools and doing lots of testing and experimenting, trying out different methods to see what works and what doesn't with these software with all the all the software and all these different software tools, um, and that makes me much more practically minded as opposed to theoretical. So, I'm practically minded as in entirely based on experience, and theoretical, as in based on first principles based approaches. So, I since I work a lot with these products and these tools and all these different applications, I get a lot more experience with how to and building a lot of building a lot more intuition on how to use these applications rather than starting from a theoretical standpoint uh, and kind of um, working out what would be the best approach before I get involved with these um, applications and software. Um, so that being said of like how I've kind of always been this kind of person and like delving into new trends and kind of just like uh, diving right in head first and getting a feel for all these, um, feel for this technology. Um, you guys can treat me as your guinea pig uh, because uh, I really enjoy just like kind of uh, putting, having skin in the game with uh, new technologies. Um, so for crypto and blockchain, for example, um, I, as some people might not enjoy this, but I enjoy like, you know, putting some money out there and just like playing around with these different applications, whether it's with Ethereum or, um, crypto kitties or some like compound protocol, um, or some other, um, Ethereum application or DeFi application. Um, so I know that this is being recorded. So if anyone has like suggestions on like what app they're interested in exploring, I'd be happy to like explore the app myself and like, you know, do some due diligence on an app or a project and find out um, as much as I can from like a hands-on perspective of what the application's about and what its purpose is and how it works and 
I guess like if there's any value in these projects or applications that um, some of you may be interested in. Um, so that's all for myself and now onto smart contracts. I wanted to really emphasize, uh, I'd like to briefly mention this in the last meetup, I think, um, about how Ethereum has network effects. Uh, but I, I really think that this is a very important concept to understand and to be aware of when you're interacting with these applications. Um, just, just from the perspective of having, uh, or have, having just, just from valuing, um, like getting the most on your return or like, or getting the most of your time that you're spending on learning these, um, learning these platforms. Uh, I, I think Ethereum has by far the m biggest, um, it has the biggest network and with that has the biggest community and the biggest network effects which I'll describe. Um, so network effects in a nutshell, um, this is just brief description of what a network effect is. It's a phenomenon in which as more people or users join a platform, the more the, the value of the service offered by the platform improves for those joining afterward. And network effects have become a strategic competitive, competitive advantage for digital businesses with this, you know, with now our modern world becoming more heavily focused on technology and computer science and programming. And now you have programming being taught at um, like grade schools, um, like middle schools, which is um, uh, kind of changing the, I, I guess it's like a new paradigm for businesses and how businesses um, station themselves for competitiveness. So in traditional businesses where I guess you could say like pre pre.com era, traditional bit companies built and controlled a, uh, assets, physical assets, right? We had ma manufacturing companies, um, you know, building and controlling com like the physical commodities themselves. Um, but now in the modern era of, you know, modern technology, you have digital organizations that are becoming these massive Titan uh, companies and they manage and build networks instead of managing and uh, building physical assets. Like Amazon, you have this massive network of um, basically um, third party sellers and connecting to Amazon and selling the products on um, Amazon sites, Facebook, massive uh, network of users and, you know, they have them, their Facebook marketplace uh, users on Instagram, the influencers on Instagram um, for social media. Um, so Ethereum has, is, is, is growing and it's, it doesn't have network effects nearly to the scale that Facebook or, or Amazon has, but it's definitely growing and it's definitely growing at a faster pace than the other blockchains out there. And I would say that's because it was one of the earliest um, blockchains to be pushed out into the public and be one of the first to ha be able to, to, to let developers develop on and build applications on. And that really, brought in this, like, it really allowed a, a developer community to build quickly and, and it allowed it to like spread like globally because it's distributed and decentralized. Anybody in the world can learn Ethereum if there's like relevant resources for them to learn from. Um, but there's, I, as far as I can tell, there's no other blockchain out there that comes close to the network effects that Ethereum has. There's just so many learning materials out there. There's um, like blogs, articles, um, books. Um, the, the there's um, Udemy courses out there for um, Ethereum. Um, and like I've taken one, and it was like um, amazing. Um, it like takes you to like zero to one of like building of uh, a full stack Ethereum application. Um, and you don't see that for any other blockchain out there. You don't see that for um, like Tezos or for Clayton or Loom Blockstack. Although you, for Blockstack, you'll find some um, 
some um, some of Blockstack's own branded tutorials and videos out there, but they don't come close to what is out there for Ethereum, where you have like a full stack tutorial um, that teaches you how to build a application that you can uh, deploy on Ethereum um, from the building the back end and to building the front end and then testing it out on the Ethereum blockchain's test network. I haven't seen that for any, and I haven't, see, I haven't seen that in other blockchains and I haven't seen it done as easily as Ethereum does it. And I think that's another big thing to be aware of is that Ethereum has also by far the easiest developer experience. And that also, I think that also is because of Ethereum's network effects because it's been in the game for so long and it has grown this massive developer community and this social community around the Ethereum blockchain or the Ethereum platform. It has, it has allowed developers to, it has given developers time to make that developer experience be easier because they've had more time to work on, you know, uh, simplifying the complexities of uh, developing applications on Ethereum and these other blockchain platforms out there haven't had that haven't had that scale of community to hey, hey jason yeah uh, so i was just going to say i i think yeah you um you're absolutely right ethereum has this huge first mover advantage um do you think that any other network would be able to overcome it or if if so what would it take for another network to get up to be a competitor with ethereum yeah um I, so I've gotten asked this on interviews, actually, uh, two times on two different occasions, and um, friends have asked me this too. And I honestly, I, I really think in the short term, and the short term is, I'd say, like, you know, a few years. Uh, long term is like uh, more than five years. Um, so in the short term, in the short term, I think there's definitely going to be no other platform to overtake Ethereum because the network effects are just too strong. And for anybody that understands network effects, like for, for a, 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 any platform to build that, net, that initial network effect, it, it takes a lot and it, it's, it's quite difficult to achieve, which is why you have, you, you even have venture capital firms that are entirely built around investing on companies or startups, tech companies specifically, that are just focused on um, building a network or there's companies built around some network effect for some niche market. Um, NFX is uh, sp the specific VC firm that, VC firm that I'm referring to. Um, and they, they do a lot of um, uh, analyses on network effects and why they're important. Um, but I, I I don't see any other platform coming close um, in the near term. Blockstack is a close second, I would say, just because of the, um, how they were able to bootstrap um, um, their platform with um, building on, um, they, they were focused on building a, an easy user interface in the beginning with um, some like user-friendly IDs, but, they haven't been in the game as long as Ethereum has. And I think that's what's gonna drive the separation further apart. Ethereum's just so far ahead at this point and network effects, they don't, they don't just like slow down. They just get stronger and stronger over time because um, as more, you can kind of think of it as like, um, just a simple example, like Uber, for example. When Uber started out, you had, uh, you know, just a small number of drivers and those drivers could support, you know, a, a certain number of uh, passengers, right? But as more drivers come onto the platform, they can support more passengers and those more, those, it, that increase in passengers that, that want to have, get a ride in Uber then brings on the, the demand for more drivers and vice versa. And that positive feedback loop just keeps go, growing and growing. So it's the same thing with Ethereum, that positive feedback loop of more people uh, finding out the value of Ethereum and wanting to um, use these applications brings in the need for more developers um, to build these um, useful applications. And the developers um, that build these applications then attract 
um, more users of Ethereum and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I don't see a strong network effects as, I wish I could do like, you know, uh, like a hardcore um, theoretical analysis of this, but this is just from my experience and from playing around with these different applications and with these different platforms. Cause I've played around with Blockstack. I've used some of their apps, um, like their document editor. I was remember using it and it was like quite buggy. Um, although I don't, haven't seen a document editor or, editor on Ethereum, but um, just the, the uniqueness of the kind of, kind of applications that you see on Ethereum, um, they're, they're much, um, they're quite different than other blockchains. And I, I think Ethereum captures like the essence of like a decentralized application more so than what you would find on other blockchains like Blockstack. They're, the apps you see on Blockstack are kind of mirroring what you would normally see in or what you would find in a traditional kind of platform or a traditional kind of um, um, environment or like application environment or consumer like use environment so just to give you some examples like they have uh, blogging apps um, like digital wallets um, some like gambling apps um, note-taking apps you know a lot of like basic applications out there. Um, although I haven't seen some of those apps on Ethereum, I feel like someone can quite easily work on that like and make that and push that out there on Ethereum. We already have um, some apps like uh, ENS um, um, that are like allowing people to like make their own domain or like secure their own domain and then they can you know build a, a site on that uh, or like uh, sorry host their own um, like site on that and like make a blog with that. Um, but what you've been seeing early on in Ethereum is like this wave of like new kind of applications. This like DeFi was one of them. You know, you have compound protocol and I'll, I'll get into compound protocol, but I, in the short term, two years, I don't see anything replacing Ethereum. I, I'll talk about this, I guess, in the next talk because I don't want to talk too much about this because um, I, have, I have more thoughts for the long term of why I see Ethereum um, being replaced. And it's, it, if it would be replaced, it would have to be replaced by Chia. Um, and Chia is very, very interesting for um, a few technical reasons. And um, just in a, in a nutshell, Chia, um, is a, it's, a block, it's a blockchain and they're going to be allowing um, I think they already allow um, smart contract uh, testing development, um, but no, no full scale applications yet um, or full stack applications yet. Um, but what they're, what they're doing differently is, than Ethereum is the mining mechanism and how, how mining is done in Chia is uh, a more environmentally um, friendly way and a more useful way. And, um, they basically achieve um, better decentralization through proof of storage, which requires just someone to have, you know, separate or, or someone to have a physical hardware storage. And in theory, um, from a video, from an explanation that I saw, um, so I, I, I can't really say like whether this has been like mathematically tested, but according to what I heard um, in one of Bram, like Bram Cohen, who's the CEO of Chia, in one of his talks, he um, basically described how everyone has like, you know, a laptop or like a phone or like some, some de like internet connected device with some storage on it. And that, that storage is m more decentralized than these expensive mining hardware devices like um, these ASIC mining um, chips where the the barrier to entry is is having like these large pools of capital to buy in in large quantities these uh, these mining um, specialized hardware chips um, you don't have that with uh, with a mining mechanism like proof of storage where you have people people having everyday devices with some storage on it. Um, and um, I, can, I can like sh um, share a link to the video that I'm specifically talking about um, later, or probably on the meetup page um, for the people interested. Um, but 
uh, she is very, very interesting in what they're trying to achieve. And I think they're probably the best suited to take overtake Ethereum because of proof of storage and some other um, interesting stuff that they're doing. Uh, and I don't see Ethereum currently having plans to implement something that's environmentally friendly, but I think, I think having some kind of plan for benefiting the environment is going to, or having some consideration for environmental, um, like putting less strain on uh, the environment is going to become a necessity soon with um, increased weather volatility. Um, so that's, that's just, uh, I guess my two cents or like my 50 cents since that was a long uh, talk there. Um, so moving on from um, the network effects, uh, I just wanted to emphasize about Ethereum's network effects and now talk about smart contracts and what they are. Basically, they're the backend code of programs on the Ethereum blockchain. Very simple to understand um, that way, I think. Um, a lot of people try to talk about smart contracts like they're like this... Um, um, new kind of legal representation, but the smart contracts can be a legal representation if they're specifically programmed to achieve some legally binding outcome, but they're essentially backend code of a application or some program. So these programs on the Ethereum blockchain can be anything from applications, web pages, blogs, articles, marketplaces, etc. Um, and D apps or decentralized applications is a common term that's used to refer to Ethereum based applications. And I have a cute image here of uh, just a representation of smart contracts in their place within the ecosystem of a blockchain. So you have a blockchain as a base layer. I don't know what the black layer is. Um, and then some storage, which uh, in this case you have IPFS. I think that's supposed to be IPFS because they have IFPS. Maybe it's IFPS. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Or you could think of it just blockchain, which is just all of the blue. And it also takes care of the storage. And then you have smart contracts um, here in the gray, which is the back end code. And you have these things here, which I would think they're applications, these square blocks here. And then you have user interfaces for users to interact with these applications. Um, and I, I think that's a good representation because you have this supporting back um, backend logic here, support the applications, and then you need these you need these user friendly interfaces for people to interact with these applications. Um, and I, I've been learning that myself through actually trying to build a user interface for um, this supply chain simulator project um, and looking at the other app, Ethereum applications out there and having, a, having a, a good user interface for these smart contract programs is uh, very, it's very much a necessity. Um, if you're interested in finding out what the popular dApps are out there. State of the dApps is hands down the best resource to use for finding that. They have a list of the most popular dApps for Ethereum, EOS, Clayton, um, and these are all different um, platforms. Um, I, I, some of these are blockchains, although I'm not sure if Loom is its own blockchain. Um, I would have to, I don't want to give you like false information, so I'm not sure about Loom, but Neo is its own blockchain. All these other ones are their own blockchain. Um, and they have a, a list for the most popular D apps for all of these, including Blockstack. Um, and where you can find public source code for these, um, I will actually show you. But before I show you that, uh, I actually want to show you state of the dApps a bit, just so you can see um, how it looks. And they give you some very nice statistics too. I actually was supposed to include a picture of 
um, state of the D apps, but I didn't. So I'm actually going to show you the page instead. If it can load. All right, there we go. So very neat UI. Um, it actually used to be worse than this, uh, but they've improved over time. Um, so you can see the rankings of D apps by category. Um, and if you click on one of these blockchains or platforms, you get a list and some nice statistics on the number of users um, per day, daily active users, which is a, actually a, a metric that Facebook uses to measure the, um, their performance and like how well they're doing at, um, as a business. Um, so I, I think it's interesting or I think it's very helpful to have these statistics here so you could see um, how these apps are doing, how they're contributing to the popularity of these platforms. And you can like click more stats to view more stats um, of the Ethereum blockchain. It's a nice visualization here. Um, some more visualization. I didn't know this. They have like a uh, nice box chart. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would definitely check that out. Um, very, very helpful. And um, can you scroll they, back down real quick to those those raw numbers? I'm just I, I didn't quite see that. I was curious. Oh yeah, yeah. For for comparing the different platforms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the some statistics wow. on comparing. Okay. Yeah. So you can see. So yeah, so what I was talking about network effects, you can literally see the network effects in the numbers, right? Total dApps, 2,793. Yeah. Next is. closest is EOS, which is 324. And daily active users. Just the next, um, just the third um, platform here, it's Steam. And I think Steam was, a, I think Steam may have been on Ethereum, and then they like made their own blockchain. Yeah, I think they did. Yeah. Um, or but did they? This have, is like. Yeah, they, they, I know they were tied with someone else, or are tied with someone else. Yes, yeah, so they have their own like social platform. Is basically what their fo focus is, and they have only as as a social first platform. They have half, less than half of almost like a third of the daily active users of Ethereum. Um, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, that just shows you of like kind of what I was talking about um, about net network effects. They they really are something to pay attention to. And I think going into going into like into a, if if you're looking at this as like a career, or if you're interested in maybe picking this up as a um, as a hobby, I would say you want to maximize like your long term, you want to maximize the long term value for yourself. So you want to pick a platform that has the best developer community and, and where you can, you don't want to experience a lot of hiccups along the way. And with Ethereum, you'll find the best developer community because it has the most people that have been using um, this platform. And there's so many materials to learn from. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the, your experience will be a lot better and you'll have a lot more, a lot less annoyances, um, learning Ethereum than trying to learn these other platforms here. Although that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn these platforms. I would, I would just say for the long term, you'll, you'll have a lot more stuff to learn from when you're learning Ethereum than learning um, from these other platforms. Um, yeah. Um, I actually should check out some of these. Um, so you can see it, D app activity, there's energy. It's a category for energy, which is interesting. Um, I don't know what, what energy means, but that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you can submit your own D app if you make one, and they can post it on here on their site. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, 
and they, they actually add like new stuff often and new changes like the site was updated not too long ago it actually it actually used to be worse like using this um and what's also cool is that you can access the site from your mobile the mobile app is cool and from even like metamask metamasks i should say metamasks mobile wallet um you can access this site um which is cool um but back to smart contracts so for a lot of these applications that you see um specifically on ethereum for a lot of these applications you, that you see you'll probably be interested in like how the heck do they make this app right you know it's like on ethereum and you know it might be a mystery to you of like crypto kitties for example like how crypto kitties works and um what's the logic behind crypto kitties and i i think i introduced briefly etherscan in the last meetup but um etherscan is basically this um user-friendly uh, even though it doesn't look user-friendly initially but um trust me it is very user-friendly um unless you build your own out there it's probably the most user-friendly um explorer is what they call um these kinds of um apps or sites um basically what it is is a repository of all the important uh, information from the blockchain that you would want to see and it presents it in an organized manner um an intuitive manner i would think um you have like a specific contract here and what i'm on right now currently um is the smart contract for crypto kitty specifically for um this contract right here um which is the crypto kitties um source code basically and you can look at basically any transaction on the ethereum blockchain um or any token whether that token is an erc20 or a erc721 as you can see here you have uh, for this contract what erc20 token transactions has has this contract made you can see a list with the transaction hatch hashes which is just the transaction id um where this you can see how old this transaction is where uh, this transaction was uh, sent from and who it was sent to the amount of this transaction uh the token is a parsec token i guess um this may actually be i don't think this is actually for this contract or actually it is crypto kitties core yeah yeah I, I don't actually understand this part yet of the transactions, like the token part and how this token, like Hex, for example, is contributing to the CryptoKitties core. I would um, have to do some research on this. Um, but there's a lot of information on here um, that you can find. And this is basically all information that's queried from the Ethereum blockchain and just presented um, on the Etherscan site. Um, and I want to go back to CryptoKitties. So I'm basically on this contracts page for CryptoKitties, um, smart contracts specifically. And for, um, for, for I'm trying to find a way to explain this, for, yeah, for contracts that have a um little like tab here for contract with a check mark you can look at the source code of that smart contract and this is kitty core and so this is the source code of crypto kitties and you can see the compiler version of what solidity compiler version that they were using for this code here and you can scroll through all of the code in here and this is basically all the code that CryptoKitties is running um, on the back end. So 
if you're interested in learning about Solidity and how it works, you can always take a look at some of these applications out here. Um, I'll show you another one. You can like some useful buttons here, toggle for full screen so you don't have to sc scroll through that tiny little window. Um, you can do this for many other applications or yeah, any application that you find on state of the D apps that's deployed specifically on Ethereum. Since this is after scan and it's only querying the Ethereum blockchain. So I have other apps here. Um, that's just the homepage, CryptoKitties. So yeah, so actually, oops, um, right here, I, I listed four smart contracts um, and their links that I think are interesting to look at. So here's CryptoKitties um, and the source code of the CryptoKitties backend. And there's this app called or a D app called Pro Compound Protocol, um, or just Compound, and I actually have that link opened right here, where you can see the source code of the Unit Controller, which is the contract name. Um, and before I get into talking about what the Unit Controller is, uh, I'm going to go to the actual Compound Protocol site. So you can see what it is. So it's compound.finance. Um, I'm going to open the app here. I'm going to connect my mask. Whoa, massive, massive login window. It's because I'm in full screen. Yeah. All right. So compound protocol is basically a app that lets you deposit um, a cryptocurrency of your choice and earn interest on it. And you basically deposit some and um, pay some gas, because this is an Ethereum application, pay some gas for the action of depositing that cryptocurrency amount. And then you can or an interest on it based on these um, annual percent yields here. Um, and you get some nice uh, visuals of the historical rates for the annual percent yields. Um, and there's some requirements on how much you ought to deposit um, or actually collateral factor. Um, I think that is how much you need to supply ad additionally to earn that interest rate. Um, and there's also, they give, they give you the option to borrow, although personally I think borrowing is risky because um, the interest rates are actually much, much higher than the, the supply rates. Um, but, um, I'm not telling you here to talk a lot about the application here, talk about more of the code. And interestingly, you can find the backend code for compound and for actually for a lot of the, for the logic for interactions that are made with these cryptocurrencies. So one of the core contracts of compound is their Unitroller uni contract. And the Unitroller uni contract serves the function of a comptroller. So basically, it's in charge of accounting and just keeping track of the transactions that are being done on the application. And I have a definition because I had to look up what a comptroller was. Um, but um, I'll talk a bit about the significance of why this um, Compound's comptroller contract um, is very interesting from, 
from the perspective of automating um, managerial roles. But uh, you can see the logic here, um, and it's pretty dense. Um, this is one of the more dense contract files. Um, very, very interesting to look at um, when you have time. Um, they have like several imports here. So this is all actually several files, but just all consolidated into a, one large Solidity file. You can see another import here and the initial import um, or initial designation of the Solidity compiler here. Um, some of these, uh, oh, I think, I think all of these are, they have to be the same. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, very interesting to look at. Um, just to show you how long this file is, it's like over 2,000, over 3,000? No, just 2604. Um, I've been trying to study this contract uh, myself because um, um, <clears throat> it has some interesting stuff that it's, it's doing. Um, and there's a lot of cool apps out there. ENS is another one. DYDX is a decentralized exchange that I introduced um, earlier. And they have their contract on here. I think this is ENS, though. ENS is um, a Ethereum domain registry. So actually, I have a tab open here of ENS. So you can basically like save a domain name that you'd like and have it hosted on the Ethereum blockchain. And then they, Ethereum name service then takes that domain name as an address and then converts it into like a user-friendly name. And like .eth is like what these domain names um, end in. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so this is what I was referring to earlier where you can have like save your own or like purchase your own do domain name and then host uh, like a blog on that domain name. And you have a lot of apps that support Ethereum name service. So if you haven't want to have a blog with a, uh, let's say a paywall to access your blog, um, people could easily integrate uh, a wallet to, if they're going to access your page um, and then pay like some like 50 cent fee to have, to access your page. Um, they can do that with MetaMask or any of these other um, digital wallets here. Um, and then they also integrate with these other applications here too. It's pretty cool. Um, haven't done a lot of research on ENS, so I can't talk more about that, but um, they have the documentation. Um, there you, you can check out if you want to learn more. Um, but what I find more interesting is the source code because <laughs> you can see like, how the heck do they build this thing? Um, if you're interested, um, it's right here, uh, which I linked into that slide page. Um, so this contract name is the base registrar implementation. So as you can tell by the name, this contract manages the records of all the domain names that get, um, or of, of any domain name that gets um, requested to be made and then gets um, saved and paid for and uh, put pushed to the Ethereum blockchain. This is a contract that does that. Um, and it's also quite dense as well. Um, I think it's about like under 2K or 1548. Um, yeah, I really like um, having the ability to look at what these popular apps are doing um, from the back end side is like very helpful for a developer who wants to learn like you know how would I make something that's like you know an an a d app that uses ENS for some some action or or if I, if I want to have like you know an Amazon marketplace or a marketplace that um, like lists people's ENS domains or something like that. Um, if you want to make an even better EN, ENS or like your own domain name service on Ethereum, um, you can use this as inspiration, uh, right? Uh, so I, I think stuff like this is just really, really cool. And you can't find this on other platforms like Blockstack or IOTA or 
literally any other blockchain. Um, and here, here's DYDX's um, smart contract. They're super dense because they're basically implement uh, a market maker and like a whole bunch of other exchange logic. And from, as you know, financial exchanges are like really complex. Um, yeah, just show you the app really quick of what it looks like. So all of this backend logic is entirely in solidity, if you could imagine. Um, maybe not this part right here because um, it's just like replying to someone from some app intercom. But all this stuff here from like the buying and selling to getting uh, a, a margin trade initialized to connecting your wallet and, you know, borrowing some money, checking your balances, um, probably not the help stuff. Maybe, uh, probably not though. It's probably like going to a different um, uh, address. Yeah, but you can look at the code on an Etherscan. And it's actually also very, very interesting to look at. Although I'd say more complicated to look at since it's longer. Um, and since it's a decentralized exchange, um, Gonna have a lot more complex logic here. Um, implement like market maker. Let me see if I can control. Yeah, you can control F into this little window and it it works. Market uh, maker. I don't know. Um, yeah, control F in here. Find certain keywords that you're interested in. Uh, over three thousand lines already. Pretty crazy. Not even there yet 5698 so yeah very dense um but very very interesting to look at if you're if you're like on the advanced side of solidity and or advanced developer and want to like just dive right into uh learning how to develop on solidity look at these applications and their source code um like dydx and you can really learn a lot from these um, and Etherscan has other like interesting functions. Like you can click on this similar button, find other contracts that have similar contract codes. Um, this one doesn't because um, it's like super complex, um, but it, it works for simpler apps, I think. So if I go to CryptoKitty, um, actually go back here, close that. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. Reset. Well, it used to work. It actually might work for like chains of smart contracts. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's not working right now. Um, it has this outline button, which you can see just an outline of the overall structure of the contract itself. So you don't have to go through and looking looking through this entire contract line by line. You can use this button to navigate the higher level structures easily, or the higher level objects much more easily. Um, this new button is actually really cool. So it has a solidity to UML um, feature. Um, click this button and it automatically generates a UML diagram of the entire Solidity file, which is probably a lot to handle. Um, but once, once you become an advanced user, this could be helpful to look at to understand how the different objects are interacting with each other in the, in the entire Solidity file, which could be very beneficial for an advanced developer. Um, who's trying to build like uh, a complex application on Ethereum. And this is actually a new feature probably released like literally in the last um, several, I'd say like at least last several, last five months, it was, this is, uh, was released. 
Um, yeah, that, that is it for that. This is an other contract, but um, this contract um, is a bit more complicated. And I want to talk about this for next time because this is a very interesting uh, project. They're called Nexus Mutual. Um, and I have a link to that um, contract address um, in the other slide. And this button right here, um, if you weren't aware, it just links to Etherscan homepage. Um, so yeah, so Nexus Mutual, just a quick uh, tangent. Nexus Mutual is a very interesting app that does mutual insurance um, or tries to do mutual insurance on the Ethereum blockchain. And you can find their code um, right here with this link. And it's uh oh. Jason, are you still there? I think we may have lost Jason. We can give him a minute to try to reconnect. But anyway, that was a, it's been a great presentation so far. I know that he is planning to uh, post the slides and those links on our meetup page along with um, the archive of this video. So let's just wait another sec to see if he comes back. All right, just let me know. Um, yeah, we got you back. So um, you were talking about the mutual insurance. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so before I get to uh, the mutual insurance, just briefly the, why I introduced those other apps and list those contracts um, source code was because they, those contracts achieve, um, or what they serve are interesting roles for their applications. So a comp troller, what the, the unit troller for compounds, um, unit troller contract, what a comp troller is in the, you know, traditional world is a management level position responsible for supervising the quality of accounting and financial reporting of an organization. Um, the compound unit troller contract basically serves the role of a comp troller, uh, which is traditionally a managerial role. And for ENS, they have a base registrar implementation. And in the traditional world, a registrar is an official individual, you know, a person responsible for keeping a registrar um, or keeping a registrar or official records. Um, so again, another instance of like automating a traditional role. Um, although this role is, you know, kind of been on the process of being automated a lot, you know, like a blockchain is kind of already keeping official records, you know. Um, but DYDX, automating the role of a, a market maker, that's a very complex thing to do. Although in the, you know, financial market space, um, a lot of people have been trying to do this for some time, but still automating it on Ethereum is very, very interesting. And I would imagine difficult, more difficult than um, in your traditional programming environment. And just to what a liquidity, uh, what a market maker is, it's a liquidity provider that provides quotes of both buy or sell prices in a financial instrument or a commodity held in inventory, hoping to make a profit on the bid offer spread or turn. Um, so I, I, as you can see from me presenting these contracts and what their roles are for the apps, you can see that there's kind of this um, this trend of like m automating these traditionally complex tasks um, and actually doing it successfully, right? Like in the comptroller's case, uh, that traditionally may seem like a complicated thing to do, but they're actually doing it um, and they've been doing it for a while now. Um, mutual insurance. So Nex Nexus Mutual is the name of the, the startup that um, has these contracts um, on the Ethereum blockchain that I linked to. Um, they basically try to achieve uh, smart contract insurance and how they do this is by allowing anyone to stake some ETH or DAI on their platform on their dApp and then vouch that that stake basically vouches for the security of that smart contract and it could be any smart contract that's public on the ethereum blockchain so any smart contract that you can find on an etherscan um you can basically vouch for the security um for some set time interval and then 
that amount that amount that you stake then covers some cost if there were to be some like hack or some bug in that smart contract code or, or a hack against that smart contract code so there recently was a big hack that happened and that's what i want to touch on not touch on that's what i want to talk about for the next talk because uh, it's a very very interesting thing that happened and it's a very interesting app that it happened on um, which is smart contract insurance um, and I was, I was just going to talk about, this is my last slide, about what we're doing um, at the U of I. We're trying to build a supply chain simulator, which tries to uh, build an autonomous supply chain manager. And how we're trying to do that, we're trying to make an easy user interface for supply chain managers to use and to manage their supply chains and let the blockchain handle all the information flows and uh, payments that happen in the different steps of a supply chain. Um, and have a, the GitHub repo here for, you can see what we've been working on. Um, and yeah, this is like a long-term goal, but um, from what I presented, I think you can see that um, people are already trying to automate manage, some managerial roles, even if they're like the simpler ones. But as time goes on, I would definitely, you would, we would definitely start seeing the automation of more complex uh, managerial roles, or at least the attempt at automating some of these more complex managerial roles, like the role of a supply chain manager. And that's all I got. All right. Well, thank you. That was excellent. Do we have yeah, any? Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, am I the only one here? I think. Yeah, the only I don't one see online. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll let other people ask. No, no, you go ahead, please. Yeah, I think you're the only one in the audience. Oh, nice. No, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm so far behind on on D apps. I just wanted to get a good idea of how to get involved and how to view the different ones. So this was really good. Yeah, uh, I I would say. Um, well, I, I see that you joined a bit late. So I, I did talk about um, Etherscan and were you, were you that there for when I, when I started talking about Etherscan? I caught the very end of it and I did a quick search on it. So I was able to okay. look it up a little bit. Yeah, so I, I'm going to post the slides um, on the meetup page in the comments section um, so everybody can access um, what I went through. But Etherscan is where you could find a lot of the code for these apps and for where you go to find the apps, State of the D apps is your number one place to go. Um, it's been around for at least a year now, maybe even two years. Um, and their their site has grown to be very user friendly and easy to use. Um, I was showing Adam uh, some of the statistics you can find for these apps. So just here's the rankings for these. Um, you can also find Ethereum statistics too, which is interesting. Um, I, I initially started talking about um, why Ethereum is where pe new developers or people that are new, newly interested in dApps or blockchain, I, I think Ethereum should be where people spend the most time learning and spend the most time um, getting hands-on experience with. And I was talking about it from like just from my experience of network effects and why I've seen Ethereum have like these massive network effects compared to other blockchain platforms. And uh, I didn't talk about state of the DApps and the statistics they had here, but we went here and Adam pointed out to me like the statistics here and you can clearly see Ethereum is way ahead of these other platforms here. Um, which yeah, just I did see that. Yeah, it just confirms why um, Ethereum is going to be a very strong platform to, it's going to be the most popular platform, at least for the next two years. Oh yeah. Um, that first mover advantage. I mean, it's, it's everything right now. Yeah. Um, you can see in that number the the number of contracts it has, um, daily active users, total apps, um, by far has the most apps. Um, <laughs> um, and it has the most amount of learning materials that you can find because it's 
has these massive network effects and there's been this developer community for so long. Uh, there's so many materials to learn from online. Um, and if you, if you're interested in learning, um, in with, uh, once you become like more advanced user or a more advanced developer, um, another way to learn, um, from the Ethereum platform or just the Ethereum blockchain is using Etherscan. Um, just going on state of the D apps and like finding a cool app that you think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, you can find the smart contract code for some of these like crypto kitties. Here's a source code for crypto kitties on Etherscan and, um, some of these other apps like compound protocol, ENS, you can find the source code for these contracts. If you want to learn, you know, some more complex development techniques, you can just like go to some of these apps and they have their public code on here, which is amazing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Any other questions? I guess I'll, I'll throw one out of left field. Um, you talked in the beginning about um, sort of the difference between um, formal methods coming up with like first principles before you start designing and then just um, uh, how did you put it being more practically focused and just saying like, hey, here's the ecosystem. Let's just start building, um, I, which I thought was uh, a helpful way to look at it. What, but what do you think are some of like the biases that are built in when you just start developing? Like what have you seen as the biases yeah. of, of Ethereum that you've had to adapt to? Yeah. yeah, I I love that. I actually really, really like that you asked this question because I, I was actually trying to um, get this message across um, in, I, th I think it was our, our second meetup. Um, so it was basically the meetup that was before, it, it was basically that one long meetup that we had where I went on like on talking about this big uh, kind of rant on like where what Ethereum is and then like the different apps on Ethereum and it was just like a lot for everybody to handle. Um, but the big message that I was trying to get across there was um, that um, from the beginning of since since the introduction of Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, a lot of the focus was on money um, in the space and you know how can I get more of it? How do I like multiply my money that I have, right? And the developers that were first to work on these um, protocols and these platforms um, and on Ethereum were the people that were attracted first because of the money. And either they, they got um, really wealthy from, from, like, from like working on these projects uh, early on before a lot of people were aware of them or they had a lot of money to begin with. And I would, I would think that there were a lot of people that were early um, developers in this community that then became very wealthy later on. And I think that that um, trend kind of stayed on and like brought on the DeFi movement, or I guess you could say the DeFi trend. We had a lot of people pushing out like finance applications and I, one of the things that I, I saw with these DeFi apps is that there's, a, there's a lot more like interesting code of like these developers trying to like build something like unique, but the finance part is like kind of lacking in some respects relative to what you would find in like your traditional finance world. And I think that's because you have these developers who were just like, became very wealthy developers, you know, and we're just like, you know, I'm going to develop a new application that's like, you know, DeFi, you know, like disrupt the finance markets, but they didn't have that finance background going into this, you, you know, like they started off as like super strong, super intelligent developers and then just became really wealthy. And then they're, they're just pivoting to building financial applications. Right. So I think that's, that was kind of like, uh, one of the things that I, I think people, you know, taking that, but um, practically minded approach in the space. There was a lot of people coming in to that, coming coming in with that um, development perspective in mind, um, or just that like like you know how do I learn fast uh, 
coming into the space um, early on. And I think that's just like the software, um, the, like, you know, Facebook's mantra was like, you know, move fast and break things and, you know, ask for forgiveness later. And I, I think that that kind of was responsible, that kind of mindset was responsible for the apps that you were seeing early on in the space, like DeFi apps. Um, but I, I think that, I think that now that kind of wave has passed or is like starting to pass, I think you're going to start seeing more like user focused or like consumer focused apps. Um, as now, you, as now you have like app application developers that didn't have that um, drive to build the apps solely for money's sake, you know, the, the barrier to entry has been significantly reduced where now a new developer can learn solidity and build something um and in much less time than um what was than it normally than it, than it used to take um and yeah i i was gonna say something else but i for, completely forgot what it was no um, no that's yeah, all right that, that was yeah, a great explanation that was really interesting so i appreciate you sharing those insights yeah all right well no i think problem. it's about time to wrap it up here so um, yeah, I guess we'll uh, say thanks for the demo, um, at Daniel. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> and we'll uh, I'll stop the recording so we can post this uh, to our meetups page, and our other members can watch it when they get a chance. So yeah, take I'll care, everyone who's watching this recording. Thank Jason, you. I'll let you, have the, take care. I'll let you have the last word, Jason. Okay. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Bye.